Okay, so good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome back on to this forum, uh, the the online interactive uh, lectures uh, that the INO project has been organizing for the past uh, about four weeks now. And in fact, this is the 11th uh, lecture. Uh, we have today Professor Ujit Yadnik uh, from IIT Bombay. He obtained master's in physics from IIT Bombay and PhD in physics from University of Texas at Austin uh, in 1986. After a postdoctoral position at TIFR, uh, he has been on the faculty of IIT Bombay since 1989. Uh, currently, he's also the convener of the Center for Advanced Study there. He has been a visiting professor at McCall University and also University, University at Montreal, Canada and the University of California Irvine at USA. Uh, he has been a visitor to ICTP Trieste, Italy, as well as Premier Institute Canada and other centers of advanced research in Germany, South Korea, Japan, and China. Uh, his research has been mostly concerned about unified uh, theory, supersymmetry, general relativity, and cosmology. Uh, so now we, uh, today, of course, he's going to talk on neutrinos and matter antimatter asymmetry. A unification perspective. So, what to you, Nick? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the nice introduction and uh, welcome to you all for this talk in the series on all about neutrinos. I'm very happy to be speaking in it. Uh, it's one of the most interesting forums we have on neutrinos right now, especially because the INO is. Uh, getting active again. Uh, I hope that you have all been keeping safe and doing well. And uh, I hope that our participants from the East Coast are also safe and fine with that uh, storm passing by. So I hope everyone is uh, going to enjoy this talk. So uh, I have been told that uh, I don't want this talk to be very heavy. At the same time, there are some very interesting concepts that have emerged in the course of trying to understand neutrinos. So I will try to focus on a few uh, topics that are that make the whole topic of neutrinos uh, very, very intricate and interesting. Now, you people have already had a big dose of uh, basic neutrino physics, its origin, history, Wolfgang Pauli's hypotheses, etc., and Fermi theory, etc., etc. Um, you know, for the longest time, neutrino was thought to be a uh, little bit of a pest. You know, you are trying to solve the strong interaction problem. You are trying to understand the main aspects of weak interaction. And these almost massless neutrinos are buzzing around and okay, they carry off some energy, but then why worry about them too much? So, but I think they already had shown their unusual character, uh, even back in 1964. And uh, how they have begun to dominate the landscape of our particle physics in the last 20, 25 years is what this talk is about. So, uh, so the I just want to focus on uh, two things. Why neutrinos oscillate? This probably you already know from several previous talks, but I will just recapitulate it for the purpose of this talk. Um, and then I will talk a little bit about what we know about the matter antimatter asymmetry <clears throat> in the universe and how we view this as a very crucial ingredient of the particle physics uh, problem. The point is that as of current uh, status, we do not have a way of solving this or understanding the matter antimatter asymmetry within the standard model of particle physics, even with the right-handed neutrinos uh, included. We do not have a clear cut solution that yes, this is how it happened. But we do have a mechanism in place and that is what I will discuss in the second half. And then third half, I will try to tell you why this has to do with unification of forces. 
and it is very interesting because the tiniest bits of matter which uh, whose weight is uh, 10 or 100 millionth of an electron mass the electron being the lightest lepton uh, even something that million times lighter can actually connect us to the very high grand unification scale of uh, 10 raised to 14 10 raised to 12 gev so that is so this is the whole aim of the talk to say how the neutrinos have the potential to solve the matter antimatter asymmetry problem and um, how they lead back into the grand unified era so this is just to refresh your memory about how neutrinos oscillate we basically have a two level system with um, two states phi a and phi b but the time evolution is given by matrix hamiltonian which uh, has dominant diagonal um, eigen values and then it has some off diagonal elements in the basis phi a phi b that we are using so phi a phi b is the observationally preferred eigen states uh, that is why we are stuck with these off diagonal pieces but the complete hamiltonian then would mix the two up as the time evolution would unfold and this problem is well solved in quantum mechanics books and you have these two levels the unperturbed ones and then the v would split them and there would be a difference if this uh, difference is delta then if you start with one of the epsilon a eigen values then the system will tend to oscillate between the two because of the presence of this perturbation if you are directly in epsilon plus of course nothing is going to happen or epsilon minus it will stay put but considering these are the preferred for some reason physically preferred eigen eigen vectors if you start with some admixture of this then the system will keep oscillating between the two determined by the parameters of this uh, hamiltonian so in neutrinos the way this comes about is that the observationally preferred uh, eigen state is the weak interaction basis and the reason is obvious the sources of neutrinos are all weak nuclear processes whenever there is a weak decay or uh, inverse beta decay etc so you have a weak interaction process that generates a neutrino and therefore naturally our interest is the weak interaction basis however when they are propagating freely through let's say vacuum it's really the mass the rest mass that matters and not this weak interaction eigen basis and what we find is that there is actually there are mixing matrix elements that mix up the weak interaction basis and that is why there are oscillations um, it is also interesting to remember that the emission is assumed to be in momentum eigen states and so the kinetic energy of the neutrino also oscillates as it goes along uh, so here is uh, further detail of that so what we understood was that uh, there are there is a preferred basis which is weak interaction basis and there is a mass basis mass eigen state basis so what is this mass eigen state basis well uh, as you know we can derive that we wrote an equation of motion on the previous page we can derive such an equation of motion out of a lagrangian density and now we have switched to fermions instead of just some random phi a phi b so here is that dirac uh, lagrangian density where you have psi bar gamma mu which are the special gamma matrices i i'm assuming not everybody is completely familiar with dirac equation but you do not have to really know it too much so there is the kinetic part of dirac equation kinetic energy and then there is the mass part of dirac equation which is quadratic in the field psi bar mass times psi sorry there is an extra m here which should not be there because i put this m here now so the point is the the kind of equation of motion of hamiltonian evolution we saw on the previous page can be got by doing dl by d psi bar so if we vary with respect to psi bar we are left with this derivative of psi equal to 0 and then psi bar peeled off from here would leave behind derivative psi equal to m psi which is the kind of m and now it is mixing up the various generations a and b this mass matrix 
so this slide is mainly to explain what we mean by the mass matrix and um, what is the basis which is the true eigen basis when they are free to travel through vacuum or through say earth's crust or something like that which is not the weak interaction eigen basis and so that free uh, free to flow eigen basis is obtained by diagonalizing this mass matrix but if you use the preferred eigen basis which is the weak interaction basis then this mass matrix will continue to have off diagonal elements so that is the whole point idea of what is a mass matrix and i'll warn you that uh, this mass matrix is going to keep getting more and more complicated but you can just keep in mind that it is some matrix and uh, in the preferred eigen basis of our uh, weak interactions so then the way it gets more interesting especially in the case of um, neutrinos or fermions is that fermions as dirac discovered them um, come such that their number is intrinsically conserved as you know dirac's four component equation automatically implied anti particles which meant, meant that there was a definite sense of what is a particle and what is an anti particle so in dirac theory <clears throat> you have uh, particles as well as anti particles packaged in the four component basis however from the point of view of uh, lorentz invariance they can be split into two parts left helicity and right helicity right now i will not get too much into detail except that helicity is the sense of how which way it is the pro spin projection on the direction of motion so it is sigma dot p it is whether it is rotating right circular it is going forward or left circular so that's basically the idea of uh, the two helicity components and then one can write the dirac mass matrix if we if one wrote dirac equation in this particular basis and also assume that these are the weak interaction eigen bases then the dirac mass matrix will look like mab psi left bar a psi right bar b so from the point of view of lorentz invariance it turns out that you never get psi l bar psi l that is actually zero it's identically zero because of the way it is constructed so the only kind of mass terms that the dirac equation gives us are where the left and right uh get mixed using this uh, matrix and if it was diagonal then of course it would be just some mass values times psi l bar psi r and we call the combined package psi l and psi r as our preferred fermion but there was one mr majorana a very clever man who was contemporary of enrico fermi unfortunately did not stay on very long in physics um he realized that it was actually possible to also impose a condition where you set the four component dirac fermion to be its own charge conjugate so this is just like what we do for photons we use sometimes complex notation in electrodynamics but then in the end when you have to write out the fourier uh, fourier transform we re remind ourselves that the e field is its own self conjugate and b they are after all real fields so we although we expand them in complex notation with e raised to i k dot x we remind ourselves that e star has to be e b star has to be b or the vector potential has to be its own conjugate this becomes just like that it just says that the four component dirac equation is its own conjugate so the left and right handed components remain but then somehow they are on charge conjugates you do not have a distinct anti particle so we are left with two degrees of freedom one consequence of this is which we don't have time here to write out but it's very easy to see it turns out that fermion number would be violated so if you took that dirac equation and tried to find the conserved current like we do for in quantum mechanics 
uh, right uh, conserved density and probability density and a probability current that combination would not that current density and current will not come out conserved and they, that non conservation would be proportional to the majorana mass and the majorana mass matrix looks like this where you as firstly first thing to note is that the majorana mass involves either the purely left handed doublets or purely the right handed doublet so with the purely left handed doublet the term looks psi l transpose and the charge conjugation matrix it's from the gamma matrix algebra so that this whole combination is actually uh, such that it saturates the lorentz indices of the psi l the psi l so the majorana mass matrix has a structure like this with only the left handed fields appearing here and psi l transpose charge conjugate psi l but now it can mix the generations a and b it can mix the flavors a and b so we call this m maj and this is m dirac and uh, they both mix up the various <coughs> generations but in somewhat different ways okay so this is the thing to remember that the mixing of neutrinos is quite a intricate affair with a very intricate matrix we haven't yet seen all the details of the matrix either but uh, this is the beginning although it's a it looks reasonably simple it's just bilinear so it is just ordinary linear algebra uh, it does lead to very interesting consequences so we will come back to this later and see how this helps us to tie up with the grand unification so now we uh, go off into the matter antimatter asymmetry part uh just to begin with i would say i have written out that there is no smoking gun signs of any antimatter so we know that our entire planetary system has to be just protons and electrons there cannot be any anti protons and positrons because if there were there would be some violent um uh, annihilations and gamma rays would be proliferated this feature sorry this feature continues to the edge of the universe however far we see we do not see any large regions where there are uh, matter and antimatter domains coming together or anything like that i will just show you some nice pictures uh, showing pictures is usually half the purpose of uh, giving a motivational talk so the distribution of galaxies is very very uniform up to some statistical irregularities so the question becomes where are all the anti protons and of course positrons so this is the matter antimatter asymmetry uh, issue as we saw dirac equation does not really distinguish between the two so uh, why are there only particles in the world and no naturally occurring anti particles uh before i go on to the pictures let me just also say how we quantify this uh, matter antimatter asymmetry the point is that we do have uh so whatever we have now obviously is what the universe originated with wherever you want to put put the origin it doesn't matter but suppose we put it before formation of galaxies somewhere after that the protons number would be conserved electron number would be conserved hydrogen would be formed other elements can form but how do we quantify the how much is remaining by it is by comparing it to the entropy density of the also the primordial photons the photons of the cosmic microwave background radiation so we compare the primordial baryons with primordial photons and since photon number is not a well defined quantity we write the photon dense uh, entropy density which also has essentially dimensionally the same so it's like number so we compare nb minus nb bar the net baryon number to the net entropy density in photons 
and this is the measure we use to uh, dimensionless number we use to characterize how small nb is and this number is about parts per billion okay so it looks reasonably small you know i mean typically if there are billions of photons uh, coming out of the primordial soup you know the big bang you should have some comparable number of other matter remaining but no the or of course it should annihilate completely and become zero so it turns out that if it really freely annihilated it would have been much much smaller and if it was really not annihilating efficiently then it would be much larger and comparable to photons the puzzle we have right now the real quantified puzzle of matter antimatter asymmetry is this number which hangs somewhere in between neither tiny like 10 to to minus 20 nor close to order 1 but it is precariously balanced at being parts per billion and we will see why this parts per billion is a very crucial number in uh, the kind of universe we have obtained today so and this this numbers have been verified in many different ways uh, so here are the pictures i meant to show to show how there really are no major gaps where there would be some antimatter part of the universe starting this is a fairly old survey from 1990s um, every single point in this survey is a galaxy the color coding is of course artificial to show some of the brighter and the less bright components but if you see on the whole it is pretty uh, and it is showing some pie in the sky some wedge of the sky but uh, we see a almost continuous distribution of luminous matter without any major divides or uh, partitions happening in it uh, there is of course statistical fluctuations of the distribution and brightness and so on but it is all within the limits that we still hope we understand but that certainly don't seem like islands of anti antimatter hiding out there similarly here is a very interesting um, survey of uh, quasar redshifts so did you know that there are so many quasars that people have already cataloged uh, this is the so called 2 degree field survey and it looks in, into a particular wedge of the sky and actually in a very narrow <clears throat> uh, narrow ascent ascension and i think angle it's called uh, and it is a map of the number as a function of redshift goes up to redshift of about c3 which in this which can be trans uh, rewritten transcribed in the billions of light years units so it goes on almost to about 12 to 13 billion light years away so however far you see the distribution of quasars in two directions opposite directions because of the telescope rotating i guess um, it's um, roughly continuous so we do not have any antimatter uh, patches hiding in the universe and this is just repetition of the same but i have shown this this is a 2006 review recap of uh, things it does show large features like this there is a wall here and there are some special features here which are called uh, sloan great wall and cfa2 great wall and so on and that 2d 2 degree field uh, luminous map is here that was quasar map and this is actually simulation they are trying to show that simulation can reproduce this and simulation is just pure embedded simulation without doing anything special so we are pretty sure that uh, we have this matter antimatter asymmetry this inset i kept just in case the view was not very clear okay so now uh, this matter antimatter asymmetry we have understood and i just wanted to share the excitement that um, uh, cosmology has brought in the last century and what emboldens us to actually try to solve the matter antimatter asymmetry problem so in uh, recapitulating how cosmology became a science i will also tell you how we became aware of the ingredients that allow us to 
uh, understand the matter antimatter asymmetry um i think i okay i think i have enough time so the point is that the the universe is expanding was a big shock to einstein himself because uh, friedman worked out dynamical solutions of his own equation general relativity and wrote to him but einstein didn't believe his uh, his results and einstein liked to have a static permanent idyllic universe which was not doing anything dynamic or violent however that was not going to be true and as we know edwin hubble was a rather adventurous man and he was a lawyer by training and he had waited till age 35 to be able to chuck his practice and then he joined the uh, harvard university to start doing cosmology so he was bored enough to draw a straight line through a scatter of points where professional astrophysicists were afraid of doing and there was a belgian physicist lemaitre who understood everything he believed in friedman equations and he could see that the universe was expanding except that it didn't draw the straight line and but he did write letters privately to einstein and he published papers in french language but hubble although the result came a little bit later and hubble did not try to try to friedman tied to friedman but it became popular so here is stylish mr hubble and i should also mention that hubble's success lay on the fact of researches of this lady henrietta levitt who had uh, calibrated the cefid variables which allowed uh, reasonably accurate determination of the distance scale so the other detail you can see elsewhere uh, so with this the modern cosmology was launched and as we already saw uh, 20s was the decade of understanding expanding universe but then as nuclear physics began to be better understood uh, it was realized by this gentleman gamow that you could now actually apply nuclear physics to the universe because if the universe was expanding now it's only gravity so it has to be contracting backwards if you go backwards in time there is nothing stopping it so it would keep falling back until it became so dense that nuclear forces would come into play it would all get squished together so gamma suggested to his student alpha that they could actually calculate how this big bang unfolded and depending on the ratio of uh, how many primordial photons there were different ratios of uh, nuclei would get formed so uh, i will just tell you a little bit later but basically they worked out nucleosynthesis as well as uh, alpha and herman worked out the cosmic microwave background as coming from big bang in the mid or late 40s somehow nobody bothered to search for what they predicted but then 1965 mid 60s was the classic year uh, classic years during which suddenly the cosmic microwave background got discovered they were not trying to look for it but it got discovered and also uh, as the accelerators became sophisticated and the methods became sophisticated cp violation got discovered in k meson decays so what we are going to see is that this hot expanding universe and availability of cp violation these are the crucial ingredients that suggest to us that we can explain matter antimatter asymmetry so um, just to go into more detail here it was alpha beta gamma this so called alpha beta gamma paper that estimated uh, helium to hydrogen ratio in um, uh, 1948 so they had to estimate if you start with pure all hydrogen because at really high temperature there would be just nuclear protons and neutrons and as the system cools the fusion processes would start but the and you know deuteron and lithium and helium would begin to form but the lighter nuclei as they form would keep getting blasted away by the photons that are still in equilibrium so if you tune the ratio of how many relic photons there are 
and how many how much vary on number there is you can actually calculate the ratio of how much helium should get primordially synthesized and how much deuterium should get primordially synthesized and calculate the ratio of what would remain as the universe expands further and photons become ineffective in disrupting these uh, newly formed states so as it turns out the calculation was done by alfer under guidance of gamow but gamow was a man with a lot of sense of humor so he thought that the paper authorship would look nicer if he put beta in it so it looks like alpha beta gamma and he put beta's name in it without even asking hans beta of course this uh, upset mr alfer but he was the student so he couldn't do much um, and that was in 1948 and alfer was the person who actually pursued this problem further and he later worked out with his student hermann the completely different thing much later era of the universe where the protons would find electrons and form neutral hydrogen and so from this there would be a residual uh, bath of photons left over and they estimated that today that cosmic microwave background should have about 5 kelvin temperature so this is amazingly correct of course they changed their estimate in between but well so the thing to understand is that the first one involved mev scales whereas the second calculation involved ev scales and still the whole picture was emerging very consistent so here is the picture of the three people alfer hermann uh, sorry uh, rc hermann Ra ralph hermann in his later life was at uni ut austin where i was a student but then hermann had switched to civil engineering doing transportation engineering you know optimizing uh, coupled equations um okay so the other great discovery of the mid 60s was cp violation at brookhaven national lab many of you know about this from your particle physics course that there is the k0 uh, meson uh, k0 k0 bar system amusingly it seems to have two uh, completely unrelated it has two uh, decay modes one is a three particle decay mode with three pions and one is a two particle decay mode with two pions the red two pion mode and the black three pion mode now the two pion mode is prompt because there is lot of phase space available so the decay occurs quickly but the three pion mode happens much later because the phase space available is much less but what is strange is that the um, some of the so it so you can then say that there are two kinds of uh, eigen states there the k long and k short and so on but what was unusual was that some of the k zeros showed two pi decay even much later down in the pipe so that somehow there was a mixing of the k long and k short and the k0 propagating down the pipe was not an eigen state of uh, the cp symmetry so this is what was discovered in 1965 and this became a immediate sensation because um, it meant that at fundamental level you know uh, so these were days of great excitement because weak interactions were already understood to not have parity conservation the 100% parity violation only left handed neutrinos participated in weak interaction but now there was also cp violation which amounted to time reversal violation if the theory has cpt invariance and so this was uh, well fitch and james cronin uh, note that they got nobel prize in 1980 and um, uh, oh yes and the nobel prize for cosmic microwave background radiation which was 1964 or 65 discovered accidentally by two very clever and hard working engineers of bell labs trying to clean an antenna uh, that nobel prize is 1978 so 78 was cmb and 80 was cp violation does anyone know what was 
Okay, that's an audience question. If somebody wants to answer, they can post the answer. Glass house and wine box alarm. Uh, not ex experts are not expected to answer. <laughs> okay, so uh, so now we come to genesis of baryogenesis. So now that we have a picture of the hot universe and CP violation, we can actually construct a picture of how um, matter mat antimatter asymmetry can arise. I will go a little bit faster here because these are subtle issues. But what this is basically saying is you must, of course, be able to violate baryon number, but you must have, and you should have CP violation, which amounts inter alia that there is a time reversal violation, but you should also have out of equilibrium condition in your medium so that the time reversal, absence of time reversal can play out. And some forward rates, which are faster than the others, the slower ones do not recover. And so, and then the system goes out of, uh, you know, reaches a temperature where those processes cannot happen anymore. So out of equilibrium conditions are very important in addition to CP violation so that you can create this asymmetry. And um, originally it was proposed that grand unified theories would have this, could do this because they do have baryon number violation, which fortunately we don't see at low energies. Otherwise, protons would be disintegrating, which would not be nice. But tiny amount of baryon number violation and CCP violation would explain this. The point is that the out of equilibrium condition, it means that the Hubble expansion rate has to be fast compared to the particle physics decay rates. And the thing is that the Hubble rate is determined by Einstein's equations. So it involves the Newton constant G, which is an extremely tiny number. And in terms of particle physics units, it is a huge mass scale of 10 raised to 19 GeV, the so-called Planck mass. It appears in the denominator, <clears throat> Newton constant. So it is square root of Newton constant here in the denominator. Um, so the Hubble constant is controlled by the tiny value of Newton constant and temperature squared. Whereas the rate of decays, this, this involves a lot of physics actually, because it also, it's actually involves gamma factors, which are temperature dependent and so on. But the point is the competition is between this and this. And the main thing I want to emphasize is that this competition can happen only at very high temperature. It cannot happen in late universe. The point is that the Hubble scale is controlled by a Planck mass 10 raised to 19 GeV in the denominator. And therefore it's a very small number at most low energies. So unless the temperature scale was very high, <clears throat> determine the ambient energy density, the gravitational expansion rate would be really peanuts and can never compete with particle physics decay rates. But if you go very close to the Planck scale, where temperatures are also high, the universe is hot enough, and then the temperature enters this rate in this particular way, then you can find a possibility that for some values of mass and the fine structure constant of the unified theory, you would have a competition between the two and enough CP violation that you would be left with some residue of matter and asymmetry. Uh, so it would be realized only if you have gut scale and close to Planck scale, not at low temperatures. But as we know, by 1990s, it became increasingly clear that protons are not decaying in that uh, super Kamiokande experiment. And uh, till date, SK has not reported any proton decay. So this kind of baryogenesis is not going to work is by now sort of clear. And uh, this is where neutrinos come in. But uh, the, so we would have leptogenesis instead of baryogenesis. But before I go on, let me just recapitulate what I said so far. We said that neutrinos oscillations are governed by a mass matrix 
which also encodes some amount of CP violation because there are complex phases in that matrix. Big Bang confirmation and discovery of CP violation happened almost simultaneously in the 60s. And therefore, once we have B violation at gut energy scales because of that competition with H, so if you have B violation at gut scales and CP violation, then you have a hope of explaining matter antimatter asymmetry. But B violation has not yet been observed. So our other chance is L violation. And that looks at present time the most promising way that matter antimatter asymmetry arose. And you already begin to see the high scale and the low scale connection because somehow you must have very high, uh, high mass neutrinos <coughs> uh, to play some role. So it was pointed out by uh, these two uh, Japanese physicists, Fukujita and Yanagida, 1986, that there are Majorana masses in the neutrino sector. And I had told you that although we cannot derive it, we can show that if there are Majorana masses, then the fermion number current is not conserved. And therefore, there is a fermion number violation, the lepton number violation. So there is lepton number violation as well as there are complex phases making CP invariance uh, violation in the neutrino mass matrix. And so taking advantage of that, they proposed a specific model where the decay of very heavy Majorana neutrinos can lead to lepton asymmetry generation. And somehow lepton and baryon numbers are tied together so that it would appear as matter antimatter asymmetry in the end. But the question you may ask is, um, why should the Majorana masses be at gut scale? You know, we already said so many things about why you have to be at a high scale for any uh, natural mechanism of uh, asymmetry generation to occur because there is competition between the Hubble scale and the decay rates. We know neutrinos are super tiny masses of fractions of EV. How will these things play out at all at a very, very high scale? The answer is that actually, like in our Hindi movies, there are lost brothers of our neutrinos. And that is what the link is about. So uh, the lost brothers, are called the heavy Majorana right-handed neutrinos. Sorry. So we know that the low energy experiments, weak interactions all show only left-handed neutrinos. But the fact that there are oscillations observed means that they are not exactly massless. And therefore, very likely there are right-handed components as well. Although the right-handed ones don't enter the weak interaction, through mass matrix, they get generated once those left ones, the left one being our preferred basis, but once it begins to propagate, it begins to mix with the right-handed states as well. So there are these lost brothers of our neutrinos, which we don't see in any of our experiments, but are there. Uh, and the way they would show up is the following. If you write out the Majorana mass uh, terms, the left-handed fermions would have one coefficient and the right-handed mind their own business, unlike Dirac case. Dirac, there is psi r bar psi l and psi l bar psi r. They have a common mass md. But in the Majorana case, the left-handed projections have their own mass and then the right-handed projections can have their own mass. So we can write out this as a matrix in the basis of psi l and psi r and psi l bar psi r, the diagonal would contain the Majorana mass, ml times psi l c bar psi l and mr times psi r c bar psi r. So ml psi l bar psi l, so there is ml and then psi r bar psi r and there is mr. And the eigenvalue, so now the trick is, you let this ml be very tiny. We will see very quickly why. And that's why we put small m there, symbol. But I put a big m here to remind ourselves this is big. So if we put mr very big, 
and ignore ml comparably we can diagonalize this matrix and we will quickly find that it has two eigen values one is just mr itself the, you know if md is really tiny it's mostly a diagonal matrix with zero here and mr here so to zeroth approximation mr is one of the eigen states the other one turns out in the order md square or md over mr to be md square divided by mr and the correction of the order ml over mr so if we are ignoring ml or setting it much smaller than md then we can ignore this and uh, so ignore this and the second eigen state has mass m dirac squared over mr and we can see how a very large mass for a right handed neutrino can give rise to a second eigen state so one eigen state is the very large mass mr which would be super heavy and not observable now the other one would be observable it would have a much lighter mass value and we can rewrite this md squared over mr by scaling them with respect to a typical dirac mass which comes from the standard model so standard model mass scale is determined by you know w and z masses so put 100 gev the fermi scale so it is about 100 gev so md squared if it is measured in 100 gev then to get m2 the light neutrino to work out to be just one moment please sorry some birds were going crazy so i had to so the m2 can be really small of the order of 0.1 electron volt which i think is the light neutrino masses now the delta m square values of neutrino suggest fractions of ev masses so you would get the second eigen value m2 to be 0.1 ev provide and with md assumed at the typical standard model scale provided the right hand end neutrino was at 10 to the 14 gev so this is a very beautiful connection it comes out purely from lorentz invariance of mass uh, metric structure found by i hope i have written some very yeah, gelman ramon and slansky in the uh, mid to late 70s and i've tried to draw the seesaw the heavyweight m appears here that there is a dirac mass value which probably comes from known physics like the standard model mass scale the weak interaction mass scale fermi scale and this is the observed super tiny masses observed by all our neutrino ex oscillation experiments these two would be compatible with a super heavy guy m but which would be purely majorana <clears throat> so this m would occur in the early universe would be super heavy but its number would not be conserved because it's majorana particle and it would be violating it would be decaying violating lepton number and so only if the mass matrix also contains cp violation effects we have all the things required for leptogenesis at the high scale uh, so how much time do i have i have to uh, uh, sorry yeah, uh, uh, you have easily another 10 okay. minutes okay, okay. uh any questions so far yeah there is one uh, question just right on this slide hmm. uh let me read uh, that for you this is silesh pincha it says m2 is shown negative uh, oh, yes talk a bit about the negative mass eigen value mean what the uh, <clears throat> no no that negative uh, is not very important because um, the um, these states are complex vectors and so that minus sign can be absorbed in the overall phase of the by choosing that the physical state is different so this gives the magnitude of the mass but i have put the minus sign because it would technically come when you diagonalize this matrix but that minus sign does not signify any negative mass <clears throat> okay okay <clears throat> so <clears throat> so what we found is that you can then uh, you can understand 
<clears throat> the super tiny masses of neutrinos provided there are some lost brothers like our hindi movies who have become super rich and are hiding they are not seen anymore whereas these people are you know floating around the universe emerging in supernovae and hitting our accelerator our detectors and so on so this m would then help to explain the matter antimatter asymmetry so i want to end the talk by talking about what does unification have to do with all this so what we did see was that the gut scale baryogenesis did require very high scale for the uh, decaying baryon uh, you know baryon number violating particles here we through seesaw mechanism also found a very large mass scale but why are large mass scales <coughs> natural to unification and the answer to that is that uh, is a very beautiful uh, concept in quantum field theory that the constants that we put in our coupling constants that we put in our tree level lagrangian are not really uh, true valid for all the energy scales so the couplings are not quite constants and uh, these are some scattering diagrams that show how this coupling g the gauge coupling would get would receive radiative corrections you know from fermion loop this is a gluon loop so th a three a three point vertex and so on and this four point vertex so these diagrams would actually modify the effective value of g the interaction g between the two and perturbation theory makes sense only if we agree to rescale the couplings with the energy scale of scattering so at different values of scattering you have to reset the value of g slightly and this is the real content of renormalization most often renormalization is taught pedantically as uh, you know hiding away infinities and so on but eventually as when all, and that you have to of course study but once all the dust settles the physics that remains behind is that the coupling constant at a particular energy scale q is related to the coupling at some standard scale like here the z mass scale but with a logarithmic correction that runs with value of q, ratio of q over mz square now <clears throat> the point is that fortunately this running is logarithmic so the mass the constant is approximately a constant after all if you go hundreds of thousands of times only then it shifts by a few a small amount so that is of course a good thing the bi are some coefficients that would come from the calculations so the dependence is on uh, log of q squared so these couplings run but of course run very very slowly so the physics is mostly sensible still as constants it is because of this slow running that we naturally expect a very high scale to unification so here are the inverse couplings the, that equation was also for one over the fine structure constant one over fine structure constant so we have inverse couplings of <clears throat> the three forces this is the abelian force of uh, u1y and these are the su2 and su3 running and uh, the abelian one runs the other way whereas the um non abelian ones it this effect of uh, becoming stronger is true only for the non abelian ones so the non abelian inverse couplings are growing here with higher uh, with scale and the three the low energy electromagnetism the fermi scale and the low energy strong interaction scale they would all come together almost provided you went to very high energy like 10 to the 15 gev now this actually shows the running based on uh, i think the this is probably even quite old the lap data and soon after that when the masses low energy the up to fermi scale was all very well determined parameters but the three curves failed to meet in one point so the unification idea was dashed okay so the title of this slide is dreams of grand unification which are not yet realized but the unification idea was originally proposed by jogesh pati and salam 
by proposing a symmetry between left and right and making lepton number a part of baryon number and so on and by georgia and glashow another model uh, but they only proposed how the quantum numbers all fit nicely if you put an su5 instead of the su2 cross u1 cross su3 um but the idea that that unification was dynamically realizable was worked out by george aquin and weinberg by drawing these graphs and noting that because the coupling is, the running is logarithmic the three couplings have a good chance of coming together and at a very high scale and so this suggests that the seesaw scale may so seesaw scale may actually originate in some grand unified theory so to tie the few things up on the one hand we saw that matter antimatter asymmetry formation in early universe requires very high scale masses which are decaying and violating the number we also saw separately seesaw mechanism possible for neutrinos which would naturally explain why the light neutrinos are so super light compared to the weak scale and would indicate the lost brothers at a very high scale but now you may ask why is there such a seesaw mechanism why are there this huge mass uh, heavy myron and neutrinos and well the answer would be those masses could be arising from some grand unified theory and its breaking scale so we would have a nice tie up of all the conceptual machinery we have wherein the seesaw mechanism would explain to us why there are super light neutrinos being seen why there is the weak scale why there should be super heavy neutrinos associated with them and that those super heavy neutrinos could well have got their mass through a symmetry breaking mechanism at a gut scale which would be a natural high scale because that is where the couplings all unite so i think in one sentence i have said the whole thing i will not try to repeat it um this i have shown because this is the latest result which is really hot and it's quite amazing that through an experiment that seems incredibly difficult to do i went through this paper uh, and it relies on so many inputs it's just marvelous and it has taken them almost 7 uh, or 8 years of data to put this graph together but what they are showing is that the delta cp the cp violating phase angle is almost certainly uh, at a really midway point it's neither zero nor pi you know the off the zero or pi this is 3.14 so this is pi if it had fallen here or there that cp violation would be tiny in fact what they are showing is that the main value falls bang in the middle it is really almost maximal cp violation that you get there are some provisos you know if uh, some things if inverted order was there then they cannot exclude exclude the zero value with so much confidence but if normal hierarchy is there then this is what it would be so it really seems a really huge progress although if you are a purist you would notice that they are not able to exclude they say so they end their paper by saying the cp conserving points conserving points are not both excluded at 99.7 level but otherwise they are however a large range of values around pi by 2 is certainly plus uh, is excluded so that is the their main message and that they are very hopeful that actually it is here and soon the zero and pi values will be excluded so you would know for sure that neutrino oscillations definitely Uh, cause cp violation and i should tell you that if you work through all the complexities of that mass matrix of three generations and meyer and as well as dirac masses and so on you can actually relate the low scale cp violation angle seen here to what it would be at the very high scale when the heavy meyer and masses are decaying so it's really a very exciting development that we have had and uh, it brings together all the great things that we have been looking at for last almost 50 years after maturing of cosmology and of particle physics 
Um, so, any questions on this? Uh, I, I will read out the conclusions. The full neutrino mass matrix with Dirac and Majorana terms uh, would mix flavors as we see the oscillations, but would also have CP violating phases. And if there are Majorana terms, then they would also be violating lepton number. And now these are the ingredients that you need in the early universe creation of asymmetry, L and CP and computation with the Hubble rate. But to be able to compete with the Hubble rate, the scale has to be very, very high. Or rather, get, giving Hubble rate the fair chance, the mass has to be very, very high. That mass would come certainly from CISO mechanism, which would also simultaneously explain why the observed neutrinos are super tiny mass, you know, the, the partners of the super heavy ones. And the super heavy masses would have a nice explanation in terms of grand unified theory like SO10, which still is a possibility. So thank you very much. And I've typeset with a particular software called TechMax, which I really like. Thank you. Thank you very much, Urji. Uh, so now uh, if there are some questions uh, from the participants, uh, the speaker will be able to take up them. So uh, please flag uh, if you have any question. Uh, so I, I want to take you to one question that was on T2K. Uh, so let me read the question. Um, this is from Syed. Uh, he says, recently there has been a lot of talk after the T2K result got published that uh, hint at CP violation in the neutrino sector. Uh, these results could be the first indication of the origin of uh, the matter antimatter asymmetry in our universe. Uh, what I understand is that such an implication of CP violation is solely based on the postulate that the, uh, the moments after Big Bang, uh, there was an equal amount of matter and the matter. My question is how the postulate is better than the other one, which assumes that the universe started with a ratio greater than one of matter to antimatter. Uh, so, is there any reason other than aesthetic one which justifies the said postulate? No, this is a rather intricate question and uh, uh, I hope I don't lose the rest of the audience. Uh, but basically, there are two issues. One is um, whether the baryon uh, minus lepton number, uh, baryon minus lepton number is a gauge charge or not. Okay, so this issue of whether there would be some primordial, very simply put, the question is asking, if there already was some primordial asymmetry, then you should not have to struggle with all this to you know generate it. Um, the point is that the fact that the number is hovering at parts per billion, which is neither too tiny nor too large, uh, we hope that we would like to explain it from dynamics of the universe rather than accidentally uh, generated. Definitely. And the point is that if B minus L was a global charge, then quantum gravity effects could leave behind arbitrary amounts of global charge. And then, of course, there is no point struggling to prove anything, but then you would have the gaping question why it created exactly this much, which can at low energy just comes to parts per billion. But uh, yes, that remains, it certainly remains open that it was created uh, primordially and then it didn't evolve dynamically at all. But you would still have to take, if the current uh, observations are progressing right, there would be still an interplay with asymmetries being generated because now we have all the ingredients present. We, if we, we do have very high scale neutrinos as well as CP violation, they would be erasing some of that earlier created B minus L as well. So we have to worry about that in a, as a package. Okay, uh, we have a question from Naveen. Uh, Naveen, uh, do you have a question? Yes, sir. Yeah, please go ahead. 
sir when we constructed the dirac maulana mass term it was only for a single flavor right sir uh, yeah yeah to keep things simple i wrote it for single flavor so so what would the mass matrix look like for a, a 3 plus 0 or 3 plus 1 case 3 plus 3 plus 0 3 plus 1 sorry so 3 plus is that a uh, 3 Uh, active neutrinos plus zero sterile neutrinos or sterile neutrinos. No, no. Then it would become four. So there was um, um, this feature of off diagonal. Yeah, this. So here each of this is a block, and this block is a three by three block, the flavor block. Okay, and this is also three by three block because that is indicated. Uh, in that summation that i was writing mab i was writing earlier here i stopped writing mab so there is mab psi s i b so there is a 3 by 3 block here so this is a 6 by 6 matrix if you uh, have three flavors and if you add sterile then of course it will become 8 by 8 so so big matrix thank you sir okay uh so let me go to youtube once again uh, we have another question from shailesh uh, pincha the couplings come together at high scales but doesn't stay at same values at much higher scales in the graph uh, but won't uh, gut require all coupling constants at approximately at the same value as high scale as well that is the Mm, sorry so what is the question so all couplings come together but then stay together or not is that the question uh, why they don't stay together at, at the same value at high scale so the answer is that in the in the dream of grand unification the couplings all come together meet at one point and after that they become one curve because it becomes unified theory and the split between the three would have happened because some scalar higgses the super heavy higgses would have acquired vacuum expectation values and broken that symmetry into three pieces but up above the scale so we do have this understanding in quantum field theory that the higgs vacuum expectation value is also temperature dependent and get set to zero if you go to very high temperature so the gut scale higgses would become massless above this scale and therefore this curve would be just a single curve after that if unification really happened this is just drawing honestly what lines we get from low energy data does that answer the question ah uh, well uh, he is uh, from youtube so you wouldn't Uh, well, you can post again. But uh, you please post uh, if you are. Sorry, if he has any questions, still. Okay. Over. So by the time, uh, so I hope Shailesh is there on YouTube, and please, uh, uh, you know, answer this in case you are satisfied. And yeah. let me now go to the next question by Sadashiv Sahu. Uh, he actually refers uh, slide number thirty-nine. but i don't think you have slide number 39 30. it's only up to 31 I, yeah i think it is either 25 or 26 what i see from his question but anyway let me read the question uh, it says see some mechanism of gut uh, why there is a disagreement of value of winberg angle measured versus predicted in that gut mm. sorry to uh i think i can read my own number one moment uh, i think it is 20 uh, 25 you have uh, general mass matrix yeah and then went to this nice figure of lemman lemman yeah no so what is the question yeah the question is a little bit i am also confused uh see some mechanism of uh, gut why there is a disagreement of value of weinberg angle measured versus predicted in that gut mm. uh, see the angle no, uh, as you know we barely came out uh, being sure that delta cp is non zero at low energies 
at high energies everything is open nobody knows what the real angles are okay uh, he kind of says 29 can we go to 29 sorry yeah but that is t to k result okay okay uh, just let me read ha ah, ah, ha ah, ah. so is that make sense uh, why is he is a mechanism of uh, grand unification theory why there is a disagreement of value of weinberg angle and measured versus predicted in that part oh oh so if he is asking a very detailed question i don't think i'll have a answer immediately for him this uh-huh. is not any weinberg angle by the way this is all neutrino mass metrics so but if if he is referring to some already some calculations done which show that attempting to unify this delta cp into a high scale theory leads to a problem with you know weinberg angle i don't know the answer Th- there is no weinberg angle in any of this this is just mixing the state yeah. 1 3 mixing state 2 3 mixing because the delta cp phase appears as a, a, a sign or cosine sign of it appears in a multiple of these other angles so you can only constrain the two relatively correlated way but then these are well, reasonably well measured from other methods so this is how the confidence level comes okay uh, so i do get confirmation from shailesh who asked this uh, question about the couplings uh, that he was satisfied with the okay. answer and uh, now he says uh, okay sadashiv sahu uh, he is now referring to 28 <laughs> uh do you have anything of the ah, oh okay maybe is referring to 28 okay so can can i repeat again the question no no i so the here weinberg angle is supposed to come out right i mean weinberg angle is the uh, ratio and this actually is showing u1 y okay the uh, the hypercharge u1 but that is a secondary quantity worked out from knowing the electromagnetic charge and the weak force and so on so there are some calculation details in this if he wants to ask whether by tilting this line and making weinberg angle wrong whether i can make them meet yes probably at same but, point hmm. but of course the better solution is to put supersymmetry which is why it was uh, <laughs> justified the whole construction of lhc i i have its graph somewhere but the mssm the minimal supersymmetric standard model had the ability to get the parameter range such that they would all come and meet actually uh, unfortunately those super partners have not been found at this stage right. to provide this running okay so uh, yeah i mean the whole issue is the other way around whichever gut you make you have to try to do two things get the things to unify number one and to match all the data at lhc energies which includes the weinberg angle okay uh well i don't see any more questions now okay uh are there any questions yeah uh, i don't see so i would like to thank uh, again uh, professor ajnik for his uh, very very nice Uh, talk at a level that most of us can understand on this uh, topic and also thank all the participants for uh, actually participating in it and uh, you know by your asking questions and discussions uh, so with this i would like to end today's session but not before announcing uh, as i already did down the chat window uh, the next talk in this series which is the 12th lecture in this series uh, going to be on friday 22nd may Uh, this is going to be on precision measurements of neutrino oscillation parameters uh, by professor uma shankar also from iit bombay so uh, we request all of you to come back uh, at 6 pm on that day and uh, until then we stay care and stay safe thank you once again thank you everyone thank you bye bye